Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Here we are, another day, another video with me, Edgar, and Carrie. Why does the cat come before me? I just did in order. Mm -hmm. What's new, pussy cat? Whoa. Whoa. What's new, pussy cat? Stage fright. <laughs> you pushed your hand away. <laughs> he's more of a dancer. Um, he's not. He's more of a singer. No, he's very loud. The cat is loud and is like an alarm clock perfectly at 6.30 every morning. Mm. He will howl. He's loud and proud, this cat. He's being fussy now. When he came to us, he'd eat anything because he'd been astray and so he was used to just eating out of bins. And all of a sudden, he's acquired a taste for certain things. And so if you put anything other than salmon or tuna <laughs> in his bowl, like salmon and tuna flavoured things or... Mm. I'm not just giving him, I'm not like cooking him a, yeah. a salmon every night. Imagine. Um, he's like, what's this? I'm not having that. He knows what he wants. Mm. He knows what he wants. It's like he's a junk food cat. Like he likes all the things that I've been told that yeah. he shouldn't be having or aren't like the best things to have. All of like the healthy stuff is like... No. So no, from Edgar. I love Ollie like discovering things about cats though. Like what? Just you ask me questions, you're like, you, are all cats this vocal? I'm like, no. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, like, the only sort of cat experience I've ever had was about, what year was it? 2015. I looked after uh, two cats. It was me and my friend Martin, we moved into this flat in Leighton Buzzard. And this was my first year in Mormon, and we were looking after this flat for nine months while my mate and his, like, girlfriend went on a cruise. Not on holiday, like to work. Working, yeah. And he was like, can you look after, after these cats? Millie and Merlin, they were called. One was white, one was black. Aww. Yeah, really sweet cats. What was a bit of a sucker was that my mate, Martin, so we signed this contract January till September to look mm. after these cats and stay in their flat. And it was like a cheap rate because yeah. obviously I was buying the cat food and I was sort of cat sitting mainly. Yeah. And my, my mate, Martin, booked a cruise. Oh. Two months in, it was like, mate, I've just booked a cruise, I'm going in March, um, hope you're all right with the cats. I was like, oh, oh my god. So I became a single parent for these cats oh. for like seven months, um, which is hard, which is really hard. It's really fucking hard, whatever it is. Uh, yeah, so that happened, but yeah, they were great. There was one time when one of them escaped though, because they were house cats, oh god. and I, my, I nearly died. I was like hoovering up, as you do. Yeah. Before I left work, left for work, doing like the full house. And I was so like, not meticulous, but like conscientious is the word. With like shutting windows and yeah, like yeah, making yeah. sure everything was like, there's no Seemed, way. Yeah. Because my anxiety was like going through the roof with these yeah. cats. And then right sort of down in the door, there was this like small little window, and I opened it. But I was around that like area, hoovering up, and I obviously got distracted or whatever mm. went to unplug the hoover. Came back downstairs to do the like bottom window. Well, it's like a top window of the mm. bottom part of the apartment. I could just see black fur oh, God. around the window, and I was like, "Oh my God!" Like shut the window straight away. I was like, and then it was Merlin who do the black cat. Yeah. I was like Merlin, Merlin. Oh, Under everything, I was like, "Oh my God, Merlin's out." And oh, it was really bad because I had to leave for work in about an hour. Yeah. You know what the commute's yeah, yeah, like? Yeah. I was in Leighton Buzzard by then, so it's like quite similar to this sort of commute. I was like, I've got to leave. I've been working work at six, I've got to leave at four. Like, I've got to go. Mm -hmm. um, and I had to call Owen, whose flat it was. And I was like, and what was really bad, like the week before, I damaged his couch by accident. Oh my God. Yeah, and I was like, oh my God, I've got to call him up and go, mate, your cat's escaped. <laughs> And I felt so bad, I was like, I sort of called him, or emailed him, I can't remember. I think it was email actually, because he was on the ship. And uh, I need a resolution quickly because I'm feeling terrible right now. Basically what happened was, I had to leave the bottom door open, because there's like two doors into the flat. Yeah. I had to leave the bottom door open, which was like dodgy anyway, but I had to, with just loads of food outside. And I just had to wait, I had to go to work. And he, but then, on the way to work, because by then I was like, oh my god, this yeah. cat's gone. And then on the way to work, I got a text from Owen going, was it Merlin that went out? And yeah. I was like, yeah, he's like, oh, he'll be fine. He was like, he always, got, he always escapes. Oh. 
he said he'll come back, don't worry. And I left some food out, which I did just off my own accord, because mm. I was thinking, and I left something at the bottom door open, which was a bit dodgy, sorry, Owen. But there's like another like door with a yeah, keypad yeah. to get in. So to get into the actual house, you would have to like yeah. break into that door. Um, but that door's got the cat flap in it. So yeah. anyway, I came back from work. But like work was terrible because yeah. I couldn't relax. I was like, oh my God, this cat. What are you going to do? Yeah. Um, but I, got, I came home and he was like on the steps. He's like, meow. I was like, you little rascal. I'm so nervous about letting this one out. Yeah. So nervous. Because we were told to keep him in for two weeks, which is what you're meant to do when you rehome a cat, just so they get used to you and the smells, sort of, the smells of, of your new home, their new home. Mm. And then you've got to like introduce him to the outside. Mm. We need to take him back to the vets then and get him all of his inoculations and stuff. Yeah. Because he's had his initial trip to the vets where he had a cyst removed from his neck. Uh, was defleed and mm. neutered, so that wasn't the best. Maybe that's why it's a high meow. What's really good about Egg now though, he's gone really soft mm. compared to what he was when he first came here. It's like really like grainy, like yeah, sandy. Yeah, his fur was just filled with dirt <laughs> from where he'd just been living outside for months and months and months. And he's proper soft now. And now he's like proper soft, sleek house cat. He's a good cat. He's such a good what cat. What I had as well, this might help, I don't know if cat people have it outside, but when I was like, away for the day, mm -hmm. I'd leave food out for the cats. And I had this thing, I bought it, and it's like two panels with like lids on it. Have I told you about this? I think I know what it is though. And there's a timer on it. Yeah. And it goes, think like you put like, I think it goes to 24 hours. So you can put like a 12 hour timer and a 24 hour timer or six hours, depending when you want to feed your cat. Mm. And just like, the lid goes ting and opens and a cat just eats. I think that might be good for him, if he's like really hungry at the Yeah, morning. six o'clock. Six o'clock, six o'clock, it's closed. The thing is, there was food in this bowl anyway, he just doesn't want it. He came to tell us that the stuff we gave him was too healthy. <laughs> he wants a Big Mac. Yeah. There are other feeders that react to your cat's microchip. Oh, really? As well, yeah. And there are some where you can get them like a special collar as well. They do that with cat flaps as well. So if you get a cat flap and give them, put, like, put this special like thing on their collar, when they get to the cat flap, it'll only open for them. That's like the equivalent of having like, Gates, yeah, at your front house. <laughs> you know, when someone rolls up in the car, it goes ding, and the gates open. Yeah, we've effectively invented that for a cat. Mm. Should we talk a bit of musical theatre? Yes. Seems like we know a lot about musical theatre, and I don't know much about cats. This little question is from someone called Kaylee Schwander. Ooh. And they said, "What is something you've learned from playing every character you've played?" Mm. And there's more questions going down. So I'll just start with that one. Okay. So we can do all characters, but like, what have you learned from those characters you've played? From the, like, the character in the story, or what have I learned, like, through playing them? I, I, I'm thinking experience. Like, by doing that role, you've learned something. Yeah. Like, Carrie's learned something. Okay. Well, we're talking about cats, and I'm thinking, like, Rum Tum Tugger for me mm. was, like, a great character. And... Everyone like loves, loved Tugger because yeah. he's like a character which just like, just is himself yeah. and expressive and is like comfortable in his own skin. I think that's like the main sort of part of Tugger. Yeah. So people sort of relate to him and enjoy him when he's on stage and he always has like the best like songs or whatever and he's like just a cool cat. Yeah. So uh, maybe that really from thinking about like the way that Tugger was, because I used to love doing like Wilton Tugger because I used to like just have fun. Mm. I think maybe that, I think we, as actors and stuff, and just people, we can get like hung up on like how we look from the outside, yeah. you know, like what people might think of us. I think if you're just yourself and enjoying it, enjoy that, like, enjoy the weird stuff that you enjoy, you know, and, and yeah. that some people might roll their eyes at. Um, I think that really, I think that's a really good lesson to take mm. um, from Tugger. And uh, yeah, you used to love playing that cat. Do you know him? Um, yeah, so that's the, a lesson I definitely took away from, and I really enjoyed it, mm -hmm. yeah. I think Rob Gordon, for me, was the one to pace myself. That was like yeah. a professional lesson for me, because I've never not been able to sing a show fully, ever, until that part, because I was ill. I could do it when I was fine, but when I was like run down and couldn't go off, mm. that taught me so many things just 
professionally and how yeah. to manage my voice. I've never not like sung um, ensemble stuff before, yeah. as well as my solos, because I had enough in the tank to sing all my, both, yeah. all my harmonies and all that. And Rob Gordon was like, that lesson, what I learned from that was, you know, take it easy when you can. Mm. And also what I did as well, which was another lesson, which I knew at the time was the wrong thing to do, but it was first day rehearsals or something, and I was trying to be accommodating. So what happened was, we were doing the opening number, so Barry, Dick, and Rob had these like, three part harmonies at the end. Like, I wouldn't change a thing. Like, yeah. I wouldn't change, I wouldn't change, I wouldn't change a thing. In the opening number, search it if you don't know what I'm on about. Um, and I was like the only tenor, really. And Dick should have been on the top, Barry should have been on the middle and I should have been on the bottom. Yeah. Because obviously they were like, Rob Gordon's got loads to sing. Yeah. So that's why he's on the bottom. But they couldn't sing it. And then they would have been like, oh, I might do that. I might try the top, but I don't know if I can do it. Literally both of them. And I was like, it's a top A. I know I can do that. I was like, I'll do it. Yeah. Because then we could do it. And I was fine. But as soon as I got ill and yeah. tired, that top A did not happen. And really what I should have done was gone. Just put your foot down. And so gone, I'm going to sing the bottom. Yeah. Only because I've got. I've got loads of sing, yeah. but I didn't, I didn't do that. So that's something I can like. I definitely took from it. Mm. I should have stuck with my guns because like, in my head I was thinking, don't, don't do it, Ollie. Yeah. But I could see him like everyone like the room just go quiet because they didn't know what they were gonna do about this like top harmony. Yeah. So I was like, I'll do it. Yeah, just make things easier for people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if I could go back in time, I definitely would not do that. Yeah. Uh, I think my whole experience playing Veronica taught me just to go and do my job regardless of what people are saying because mm. there's always going to be people who have a problem with the part that you're cast as or you know think you shouldn't have been cast in that role yeah. for xyz reason because they think you can't sing it or because yeah. they think you don't look like the part or you know people are always going to have an opinion and you cannot change that but you're still going to have to go and do the job regardless because yeah. you've been cast that is now your part that is now your responsibility to play that role so whether people think you can do it or not doesn't matter because you're gonna do it. Mm. You know what I mean? What's that saying? Um, people who say it cannot be done should uh. not interrupt those doing it. That was the saying that I got taught whilst mm. in Heather's. I like that saying. It's people who say it cannot be done should not interrupt those doing it. Mm. And that's how I felt during Heather's. Like, was, I just. Every night I'd get tweets from people being like, well, I don't think Kara's a very good Veronica because she doesn't look like Barrett Wilbur Weed. I don't think Kara's a very good Veronica because she doesn't sing the songs the same. Mm. And it's like, well, it's not going to change the fact that I'm going to go on stage and play Veronica <laughs> every night. Yeah. Because I'm the one who's been cast in the part. So, like, yeah. you're not changing anything by saying that. And fine, go ahead and say it, but I need to take responsibility for not taking it on board and not letting that get to me because either I go on stage and do the job uh, and treat it as a big like middle finger to those people or I go on stage miserable because those people are making me feel like I can't or shouldn't have the job that I have mm. and which one would I rather do go on stage with a vengeance or go on stage with a face like a slapped ass <sighs> I think another like sort of one for me and I didn't really play the part but I covered it so I played it effectively, yeah. but it wasn't my part. Um, but Price, I think the only thing I'd go back or what I've taken from it is that, and a bit on your point as well, I guess, like that I'm good enough. Yeah. Like, because I recall my mindset at the time, I was such a, a goody two shoes, but in a good way, but only to, not for myself, for everyone else. Yeah. Because I felt like I was under a, like a microscope, and if I did one thing wrong, then everyone would be like, "Ooh, that's, he's a bit crap." Yeah, as a he cover. should be first cover. He's a yeah. cover, yeah. Why is he first cover? Um, or audience members going, "Oh, he can tell he's a cover." Yeah. You know? And I just tried so hard all the time to be the best. And I think looking back, I think I was good enough, but I just put myself under like immense pressure. Mm. I like, like I said, I would come in like really early and warm up and warm up and be there and go over my lines. After doing like 57 shows, yeah. I'd be still going, da -da -da, going over stuff, practicing in the wings. Because I just beat myself up and I, I did enjoy it. And it got to the point where I did like, you know, if I was doing like a two week run, in the second week I was having the best yeah. time because I did relax into it. But I don't think I enjoyed it enough. Yeah. 
you know, looking back because I was so, I put so much pressure on myself to make sure everything was perfect. So I guess that, that, that lesson is, you know, take stock of what you've actually achieved. Yeah. And also like, be in the moment a bit more as well. Mm. Enjoy I like it. that. Yeah. I still go through every line and every lyric I have to sing before I go on stage. Mm. Every show. Imagine how exhausting that is. Yeah. Like going through your entire show before you do an entire show. Yeah. It's so tiring and it's because mm. I know if I make a mistake, no one else is going to beat me up about it. I'm going to beat me up about mm. it. I'm going to sit there and have a go at myself and maybe like have a little cry on the train mm. home because I screwed up and I didn't meet my own standards, yeah. even though the audience would never have known. Yeah. I think imposter syndrome is something that mm. everyone in the industry deals with at some point or another, or deals with every time they get a job. You convince yourself that you're not worthy to be there, mm. or everyone else is better than you, or there was someone better for the job than you, and you only got the job because yeah. of X, Y, and Z reason. And, and it's hard to, it's so hard to convince yourself otherwise, mm. because it's, it's all just voices in your own head. It's someone in your head telling you that you are not worthy of being there. And then also you in your head going, no, I do deserve my place. You know, it's mm. like you having to convince yourself, which is harder than trying to convince somebody else. Yeah. I don't know if this is why, but I can imagine if you go through your life as, like, as an actor, you get more rejection than like, you know, acceptance, like yeah. yeses. Naturally when they go, yeah, you got the job. Like, you're always like, but why? But yeah. why did I get the job? You know, like... You don't trust it. Yeah, there's more people, surely better than me, because I've not been, I've not worked for a year, for yeah. example. I didn't so. get those last six jobs, so what yeah. makes this one different? Yeah. And this was a little um, extension from Kaylee's uh, question. They've said, what piece of advice would you give your characters? Because I'm thinking Link Larkin straight away. And I'm like, be yourself. Yeah. Because Link Larkin's obsessed with being like, the TV heartthrob, and he's the cool obviously in love with Tracy. Yeah. And obviously it comes near the end, it yeah. like, comes to that, and he hears himself. Well, it's really hard, because if you give your characters pieces of advice, it changes the story yeah. of the musical, so it's... Be like a 10 minute musical. Yeah. But, talk about Link Larkin, I remember, like, back in the day when I was doing character, like, development of that character. Yeah. And luckily, a lot of jobs I've done, like musicals, like Cats and Hairspray and High Fidelity and whatever, they've always been like, not the original choreography, not the original direction. So yeah. I get to play a bit, which yeah. I love. Like I get to like sort of make that character. And I remember like making Link Larkin and, and doing him how I feel I should do him. Literally the associate director came in and was like, Oli, you have a word about, you know, whatever. And I was like, yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah, Link is a bit, at points, he's a bit um, geeky, you know, a bit goofy. And I said, yeah. And they're like, yeah, it's just, he's not really, he's supposed to be like, you know, um, Danny from Greece sort of thing, esque. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, in bits, but I'm sort of going for like, when he's on TV, he's like, and I'm like, yeah. like, but when he's around Tracy, he's himself and he's like, not. Which is surely the point. Yeah. And, and he was like, hmm. Because if he was just the cool guy, he wouldn't go with you, he'd be with Amber, and that would be the end of it. Exactly, and that was my point, but back then I just didn't really defend it, and I was like, oh, okay. And I walked away and still did it in the same, because I really believed, you know, that point. But yeah, um, just sort of a bit of backstory there. Yeah. But yeah, so I'd probably say to Link, just be yourself. It's okay. Yeah. I'd say to Rob Gordon, stop effing about. <laughs> yeah. And grow up. Um, and take responsibility for your actions. Because he's a bit of a man-child. I'd say to truly, stop arguing. <laughs> just shut up. She just argues all the time. She's got an yeah. answer for everything. It's oh like, god. just, oh god, give it a rest. Yeah, it's truly annoying. Yeah. <laughs> what about Wednesday? I don't think there's any advice for Wednesday. I don't think you could tell her. Yeah. I don't think there's any point. She cheat you in the face with a crossbow. Well, there you go. There's I think no I'd say to Lucas, don't worry about the small stuff. I feel like, as a character, you worried a lot. Yeah. It's like, go with the flow. You're 19, whatever how old you are, 18. Just chill yeah. out. My advice to Lucas would be, just do what she says. <laughs> and, and do, just... Just do what she says. That girl with the crossbow, just don't annoy her. Yeah. Rum Tum Tugger. 
just keep living your life, mate. You're living a good life. Also, run some Tucker. Should I come round the house and meet my cat, Edgar? Be yeah. best mates. He looks like Nisto. He does look like Nisto. Veronica, I mean, she could probably give me some advice. <laughs> you were right in the first place. Trust your instincts. Yeah. The opening song is like, we were kind before, we could be kind once more, and then she like gets involved with the Heathers and JD, and it's like, you were right in the first place, babe. Leave it at that. Eponine. He's a wet fish. What are you doing? Marius is not worth it. <laughs> no. I feel like Eponine just had to get over that first love. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And then, you know, it would have hurt for a while. And then after that, she would be like, oh. She would have been fine. Dimitri. And then she meets someone else. Called Dimitri. Yeah. Right. He's tall, handsome, rugged. From Anastasia. Fontaine. Don't get into that fight with the factory girl. Because you will lose your job <laughs> and everything's going to go wrong from that point onwards. Yeah. So just keep your head down, babe. That's a really good piece of advice. Hide that letter quicker. <laughs> Bribe Valjean and say, I know who you are. Do you want to get married? Then a bit of money. She doesn't know who he is, though. Yeah, but if, if that was your advice. No, yeah. <laughs> You're about, by the way, who... the mayor's a convict. <laughs> <laughs> like, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's really bad. He uh, stole yeah. pan or bread. When I was a kid, I thought Jean Valjean was actually Cosette's dad. I thought Fontaine oh, yeah. and Valjean. Had I think they would have been a nice couple. Too, I think nice. they would have been a lovely couple. I don't know what the age difference is there, though. But I mean, I'm sure it would be fine. Fontaine's 28 when she dies. And Valjean no, is I like Benjamin Button, isn't he? he just keeps living. Mm. Well, guys, that was that. A bit of cat talk, a bit of human talk, a bit of talky talk. Right. Have a good day, everyone. Be safe out there. Thanks for popping by. Don't, don't, don't leave the window open if you're minding cats mm -hmm. and they shouldn't be outside. Because I did that once and they went missing for a long time. <laughs> but they came back though. Bye!